Well, amen. If you'll notice, the choir is staying in the loft. So if any of them start to doze off, can y'all, can y'all let me know and make me aware and I'll turn around and make sure they're awake. No. Excited to be uh, bringing the message this morning. We're going to continue to look at the God of the Bible. This morning we're going to look at how we serve a God that is just. A God that is, that is righteously fair in the way he treats his people. We're also going to look at a God who is merciful. A God who who relents and doesn't give us what we really deserve. See, these these two terms, just and mercy, they almost seemingly contradict each other. Just is that God gives us what we deserve, that we reap what we sow. Mercy is that God does not give us what we deserve, that that he relents and holds back. So this morning we're going to look at how these two ideas of justice and mercy seemingly Polar opposites can both be true of the God that we serve. So I want to start with a story. There was this professor named R.C. Sproul, and he had a seminary class of, of freshmen, and he was teaching them Old Testament. He had about 250 students, and in this class, the first day, syllabus day, you know, the most fun day for, for all students. He's going over the syllabus, and he's going over the dates at which the tests and papers and everything are due, and he says we have three papers in the class. First one's going to be due at the end of September, second one the end of October, third one the end of November. So he goes through and um, gets through the syllabus and at the end of September, September 30th rolls around and about 225 students roll into class papers in hand. There's 250 students in the class. So about 25 of them come into class last day of September when he had said papers are due 12 o'clock noon when you walk into class on the last day, he says, if you do not bring them, you will fail. No exception. So 225 students come into class. 25 of them walk in, empty-handed, quaking with terror, full of remorse. And as they cried out for mercy, professor relents, but ultimately says, okay, okay, okay. Look, I'll extend the deadline. Bring them tomorrow. But the next assignment is due at the end of October, and I will not extend it. Last day of October, October rolls around. This time, about 200 students come to class, papers in hand. Here you go, professor. Here's our paper. 50 of them come in. They're a little nervous. It's not really in a panic. Professor Sproul says, where are your term papers? Why do you not have them? They said, look, we're sorry, but can you please give us another chance? Look, let's be real. We know you're going to extend it, so, so it's fine. Professor, again, relents. Says, okay, this is the last time, though. He says, again, if you bring your papers late again, if you don't have it 12 o'clock on the last day of November, you will receive an F. They all shake their head. Okay, that's fine. You can probably guess what happens. Last day of November rolls around. Students stroll into class. This time, 150 of them come into class, papers in hand. Here you go, professor. Here's our paper. That means 100 of them walk in. Stroll casually into class. Professor becomes enraged. Where are the papers? Where are your term papers? You were supposed to bring them. One of the students stands up and says, look, prof, just calm down. Look, we know that you've extended the deadline before. We know you're going to do it again. Let's just, let's just take a break. We'll have them in a couple days, and it's no big deal. Professor Sproul becomes very enraged. He picks up his, his black lethal handbook or grade book that he writes the grades on in that are final, and he starts yelling out names. Johnson, Smith, Jones, all the names of the students. He says, do you have your paper? I say, no. F, F, F. You failed, you failed, you failed. The students... They get mad. They get angry. They say, this is not fair. This, is, this isn't fair. Yes, this story for the students may not be fair, but what Professor Sproul shows is that he was just. The last day of November, when the students deserved to get an F because they did not bring their paper on time, when he set the deadline, he was just, he was fair by giving them an F. The reason I share this is because what justice is, justice is that God is perfectly righteous 
in the way that he treats his people. God shows no partiality. God shows no favoritism. He is the standard. He sets the way that we are supposed to live. And when he judges his people, he, he's not going to say, well, you went to church, so, so I'm going to give you a little bit of credit. No, he judges all people the same. And in God's court, when we're going to stand before God, we have a very flimsy defense. Because there's no possibility of a plea. We can't bargain with God. He's not going to grade us on a curve. God is going to grade us according to his standard, and his standard is perfection, is holiness. He says to live like me, and God is holy. He is perfect. Because God, because God is a just God, it means he is going to judge us who don't meet his standard of perfection. So I want to say this morning, as we talk about this idea that God is just, most of the sermon is going to be at how he is a just God. It's going to deal with the wrath of God and how God is a vengeance, wrathful God. This is something that isn't very politically correct um, in today's world. Most people, if we're being honest, we don't really want to hear about the wrath of God. We don't really want to hear about how God is a jealous God or how he is vengeful, how he repays sin with his wrath. We would rather hear about heaven, how God loves us, and how God made a way, and how, and how all of these things are great. And they are true. But I think that's the more important reason why this morning I want to focus on the wrath of God and how God is just fair so we can see where we came from. We can see that God is just, his wrath must be fulfilled, and that ultimately God is going to punish sin because he hates Sin. We need to see that, that our sin does not go unpunished, okay? Just because we don't see it, just because God does not slap our hand and say, hey, stop doing that, hey, quit it, it does not mean that God does not see our sin, and it does not mean that he is not waiting to pour out his wrath on us on the day of judgment. See, I think so often God does not, at least most of the time, literally punish us the instant we sin, so we think it's no big deal. But that's dead wrong. So often we take advantage of the love and mercy of God, just like these college students, okay? What they did in Professor Sproul's class is they saw that the first time they extended the deadline, so they took advantage of it. They say, he's going to show us mercy again. He's going to show us grace. He did it again. But then the third time, these students, they found out. They found out that he was going to be just, and he was going to give them what they so rightfully deserve. And what I'm terrified of is that one day there's going to be millions of people that are going to stand before God in judgment and they're going to find out. They're going to find out just who our just God is. That we mistake God's love and his mercy as a weakness of his and we say we can live how we want to live, we can do what we want to do, we can sin as much as we can, because God's going to give us forgiveness. And we quickly forget that he is a just God. So my hope and my prayer is that this morning you would realize that God is a wrathful, just God. And if you don't repent and turn away from that and live your life for the glory of Jesus, do not place your faith in Jesus, then it's hard to hear, but it says that God is going to pour his wrath out on us if we do not do that. It's hard to hear, but it's in scripture for a reason. So I hope that this morning you would realize that and that on the day of judgment we would not have people in this room that stand before God and find out just who he is. So I want to read Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 as Abraham poses this question. Genesis chapter 18 25 he says this. He says, won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just. I want you to think about that question for a second. He says, won't the judge of the whole earth, won't God Almighty, won't the Holy One do what is just? See, we have a problem today. And I hope to, to try and fix that this morning. As we want to follow a God of love and of mercy, but we do not want the God of justice and the God of wrath. We love to hear about how God loves us. We love to hear about how, how God made a way in heaven for us. But we don't like to hear about how if we sin, it breaks God's heart. And how if we sin, we're rebelling against God. We have this huge, huge 
problem. And I fear that what we've done is we've turned God into a sort of idol that we follow. Someone that we look at it and we latch on to his love and we focus on his forgiveness while we dismiss his holiness and his justice. Billy Graham said it like this. He said, modern man does not like to think of God in terms of wrath, anger, and judgment. He likes to make God according to his own ideas and give God characteristics that he wants him to possess. And I believe most, if not all of us in this room, are, are guilty of that exactly. We want to pick and choose the God that we want to follow, but the God of the Bible is right here plainly for us to see. See, we don't want to follow the God of the Bible. We want to follow our own God. And we have a misconception that because the Bible states that, that God is love, and because, and because the Bible states that He is merciful, that He's going to forgive us, and we can live the way we want to live. We have a misconception that that because we've placed our faith in Jesus or because we've prayed a prayer, because we come to church, because we might read our Bible once a week, that we can walk out of these doors and we can live however we want to live. We can sin, we can gossip, we, we can do all the things that we want to do because God is love, He's going to forgive us. But we forget a lot of the stories in the Bible that talk about His justness, His wrath, how much He hates sin. We have a culture today that latches onto this love. And God is love, but he's also wrathful. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into this God of justice. If God was only a God of justice, let, let's look a little bit more about the wrath of God. So during the Great Awakening, there was this man named Jonathan Edwards. And he was a very, very powerful preacher. Hundreds of thousands of people heard Jonathan Edwards preach during this time and the Holy Spirit moved, and, profit, and people professed faith in Jesus, and, and, and God just brought revival to America during this time of the Great Awakening. And Jonathan Edwards has this very famous sermon. It's entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's probably not a title that most pastors today would, would choose to use, but again, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And what this was, is it was... A passage of Deuteronomy 32, 35, which says this. It says, vengeance, and this is God speaking, okay? He says, vengeance and retribution belong to me. In their time, their foot will slip, for their day of disaster is near, and their doom comes quickly. These are verses in our Bible. And as Jonathan Edwards preached on this, he focused on the line that says, in time their foot will slip. And he gave this illustration that, that people without Jesus, that, that people who are lost, who have not placed their faith in Jesus, who have not shown fruit from their salvation, he says that those without Christ dangle over the flames of hell. He says they are like a spider over a flame, dangling, waiting for it to be cut out so they can fall into the pits of hell. This kind of preaching, talking about the wrath of God and how Jesus saved us from that wrath, it ignited revival across America during this time. Because they preached on salvation through the lens of the wrath of God. But by contrast, we look at today and God's wrath has been eliminated from most pulpits, most preachers, we, we would much rather preach on and hear about the love of God and how, and how God is, is our friend and how God is, is there for us, positive messages and all of these things. But what I think we need to understand is that we must have a healthy fear of our God. We have to realize that He is a just God and that he is the one who created us, and he is also the one who can take us out. That we are not promised tomorrow. That God is standing there, and he is relenting his wrath on us. That that's the God that we serve. We have to have a healthy fear of him, realize he is the Holy One, the only God. See, this is what happens when we lose our fear of God. What happens is... We start to understand or, or start to think that love is different or is divorced from holiness. When we think God's love is divorced from His holiness, what happens is it causes us to 
lose God's hatred for sin. And as we lose God's hatred for sin, the character of God becomes mistaken. And we start to lose who our God is. And that's how we've gotten where we're at in America because we think God does not hate sin so we can live how we want to live and we completely have mistaken who our God is. So God's wrath, it's not a divine attribute that is, that is preached on or talked about so much today. But nevertheless, the God of the Bible remains the same. It was true then and it's true today. Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 declares this. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He keeps wrath for his enemies. The Bible is full of language declaring the wrath of God. So this morning, I want us to just look through a little bit, a few places in Scripture that describe just how terrible this wrath is so that we can see what Jesus has saved us from and it can push us to live our lives differently. So God's wrath, it is the vengeance that God takes towards all forms of wickedness. It is him punishing wickedness, punishing sin. In Exodus twenty two twenty four, it says this. It says, if you do mistreat them, if you mistreat the widow or the fatherless child, they will cry out to me and I will surely hear them. Listen to this part. He says, my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. That is harsh. That is something that, that, that might be hard to hear. But we have to realize that this is our God. We can't pick and choose scripture that we want to read. We can't pick and choose characteristics that we want to describe to our God. We have to take the fullness of him. And what this verse does is it captures the severity that God takes towards sin. It captures just how much God hates sin. I want to give a few more examples that show God's anger towards sin. It's real and it's deadly. In the beginning, Adam and Eve, they had perfect relationship with God. Everything was perfect. But we know the story. Adam and Eve decided to eat from this tree. They eat from the tree, so God comes back, and what God does not do God does not walk into the garden and say to Adam and Eve, he doesn't say, hey, Adam and Eve, look, it's okay. It's fine. Even though you ate from this tree, even though it was the one tree in the entire garden that I specifically told you not to eat from, even though you completely rebelled against me, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, you can stay in the garden and keep going and you not that big of a deal. It's not what God does. What God does is, is he comes into the garden and he finds them hiding because they're ashamed because they've sinned. And he says, what have you done? He says, what have you done? Why have you sinned against me? Why have you chosen to rebel against me? And then he casts them out of the garden. And the, the relationship between God and and man is broken forever. There's no longer a perfect relationship. This is how much God hates sin. He casts his creation out of the garden because he hates it. We can continue in Genesis to the flood. In Genesis 6 through 9, God saw that the earth had gotten so wicked, so bad, so sinful, so terrible, that he sends a flood across the entire land to take the people out. You think that's not a God that hates sin? That hates it when we sin? That hates it when we rebel against him? He chooses Noah and his family because Noah was a righteous man. Because Noah followed after God, kept his commandments, so he chose to save the earth through Noah. But everyone else wiped them out with the flood. Story of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was this town, Sodom and Gomorrah, who was sinful. They rebelled against God. And what happened? He brought down burning sulfur from heaven to take them out. Why? Because they sinned against a holy, just God. And we stand here and sin against them all the time and think, it's no big deal. It's not a problem. God's going to forgive me. All throughout the Old Testament, even going into the New Testament, 
The story continues. Some believe or some would say that the God of the New Testament, that Jesus, he preaches love. He preaches acceptance. He preaches how, how he just came to save and everyone can be saved. No matter what. All people get to heaven. It's not the Bible that I read. Yes, he's love. Yes, he preaches love, but it's through the context that he's saving us from the wrath of God. In John 3, 36, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's awesome. Then it continues and says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It says, if you do not obey the Son, you shall not see life. On you. From the very lips of Jesus, Matthew 5 22 says, Whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Jesus says, If you say you fool, if you judge others, if you live a life that's not according to the Bible, you'll be subject to hellfire. Matthew 18 says, If your hand or foot causes you to fall away, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands, two feet, and be thrown into eternal fire. This is how Jesus tells us to deal with our sin. He doesn't say it's okay. He doesn't say just keep living your life. He says, if any part of your body causes you to sin, cut it off, because it's better for you to get rid of that and have life than to keep living in your sin and enter the eternal fire. That means it's forever, for all eternity. This is how serious Jesus talks about sin. From his own lips, we see that he preaches that God has a wrath and he has a judgment. So I want us to picture for a second that we're in a courtroom. We're in a courtroom and, and we're on trial and we're standing before a judge. We're on trial because we broke into a house and we stole some money. Maybe we were broke or just didn't have money. But we broke into a house and we stole some money. So we're standing in the courtroom and they roll out a TV. And on the TV we see security footage of us breaking a window, unlocking the lock, going in, grabbing the money, walking out, and leaving. And not only was it just a house, it happened to be the very judge that is over the case's house. Mm. We're caught red-handed. So let's just picture for a second, we're standing there, and the judge is, is ready to declare the outcome. What would be the just thing, the fair thing for the judge to do? Guilty. You're guilty. There's obvious evidence. We can see that you committed this crime, so you're guilty. This needs to be the image that we can picture on Judgment Day. As we're all going to stand before a holy, just God. I just want you to think about what would happen if God gave us what we justly deserved. What would happen if God gave us what we rightfully deserve? Think about it. On Judgment Day, we stand before a holy, perfect God. And we can stand before him and we can say, look, God, I was in church 51 days of the year. Almost every single Sunday I was in church. God, I, I served as much as I could. God, I gave my best. God, I served as much as I could. could. God, I read my Bible. God, I prayed. God, I was a good person. All God has to do is look at us and say, remember that lie you told? Remember that time you lusted? Remember that time you, you hated somebody, you got angry? Remember the time you gossiped? We have to understand that one of those, just a single one, one little white lie says that God justly cannot allow us to enter heaven. We have to understand the state that we were or possibly are in. That if God was just, what would happen? He would look at us and say, depart from me. Not, I, I cannot allow you into heaven. He, he would punish us. 
And we would stand before him, not committing just one, but committing hundreds and thousands of sins. We have to understand that because God is just, he cannot and he will not be associated with sin. If we got what we deserved, it wouldn't be good. Do you fully grasp that? That if God did not show his mercy in Jesus, we would spend forever separated from him in hell. I want you to sit in that for a second. That's the path that we should be on. That's where we should be. Some of us overestimate ourselves and say, no, 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 I'm a good person. I go to church, read my Bible, I serve, I do all of these things. I deserve heaven. I deserve the love of God. The Bible says no one is good, no, not one. We have to come to a realization that we must be fully dependent on the grace and mercy of God to allow us to get into heaven for salvation. We cannot earn it. We cannot work for it. We cannot garner enough favor for it. We cannot slip into the back door of heaven and narrowly escape God's wrath because we were a good person. That's not how it works. God sees all. He knows all. We must understand this so that we can appreciate the links that God went through to allow us to get him to heaven. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. I want to read Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 through 46. It says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was hanging on the cross during this time. So we get this picture of the cross. The cross is where the justice and the mercy of God collide. As God being a just God, God must be punishing sin. You cannot allow people into heaven if, if sin has not been punished, but also a God who's merciful, who loves us so much that he wants a relationship with us, that wants us to be in heaven. God knew that there had to be a plan. There had to be something to allow us into heaven, and that's where the cross comes into play. As Jesus is hanging here on the cross, as he has been beaten, been ridiculed, been mocked, all of these things, as he's hanging there with nails in his hands, God looks down at his perfect son who never sinned, who never messed up, who never lied, who never did anything wrong. God looks down at his perfect son, Jesus. And instead of seeing his perfect son, he sees my sin. He sees your sin. As Jesus embodies sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us. As Jesus is hanging there on the cross, he became our sin. He took our sin upon himself so that God sees that. And instead of God pouring his wrath out on me, instead of God pouring his wrath out on you, he poured it out on his son, Jesus. Why? So that he could make a way for us to be in heaven. It's the greatest story ever told. That God made a way through his son, that he relented from pouring his wrath out on us poured it out on his son instead as Jesus was our substitute. It should have been us hanging there. It should be us enduring the cross. It should be us enduring the wrath of God. What God made for We need to grasp this message. We need to understand exactly what God did for us. See, we hear about the cross and, and we say, yeah, he died. Now I can be in heaven. But you have to understand, he saved you from the wrath of God. That if you, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you can be saved. You can be pulled away from that wrath and have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. You can have your, your, your residence in heaven if you place your faith in Jesus and if you live your life for him. Because James says, faith without works is dead. So you must live a life that is fruitful, that produces fruit. So if you're here and, you, and you've never accepted Jesus, you say, you know what? The wrath of God is upon me. As, as Jeff shared, if the room went dark and Jesus came back, what would happen? 
If you're here and you never accepted Jesus, let today be the day that, that you accept the free gift of salvation. But if you're here and you have accepted Jesus, and you say you are a Christian, you say you're a follower of Jesus, this should cause you to have an appreciation for the cross. It should cause you to realize the lengths and depths God went through just for you. It should cause you to worship differently, to live differently because it has transformed you if you've placed your faith in Jesus. Because saved people, they live differently. They're not like everyone else. We should be examples to the people around us. We should be out boldly proclaiming the word of God. Save people, tell people about Jesus. If you're here and you claim to be a Christian, we need to be out sharing the gospel, sharing about how God has saved us from this wrath. How God has saved us from his vengeance. Let's just picture what would happen if our church, the people in this room right now, took seriously that there is a wrath of God. Took seriously that there are people outside of these walls right now that don't have a relationship with Jesus. That we have friends, we have coworkers, we have family that don't know Jesus, and that if they were to die today, the wrath of God would fall on them. If we took that seriously, picture what God would do. If we begin to walk out of these doors, not live the same, not live like we always do, but begin to live bold lives for the name of Jesus, begin to share our faith, begin to invite people to church so they can come take part in what God is doing and, and how God wants to save their souls, God would begin to move. We need to go and tell people about the love that God has shown us. We need to look at the cross. We need to appreciate what he's done. We need to worship him, and we need to live for him. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much, God, that, that you... showed your love for us in dying on the cross and rising from the grave. So if we place our faith in you and we live our lives for you, God, we can be in heaven. God, I pray for the one here that doesn't know you, Lord, that has not placed their faith in you, Lord, that you would be with them, God. You would convict them and give them the boldness to step out and make that decision for you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you're here and you need to make a decision to follow Jesus, I'll be down here at the front. You can come walk and talk with me if you're here. You can make a decision right where you're at. Maybe you need to, to just sit where you are and, and think about the mercy of God. Maybe you need to thank him of the mercy he has shown you. Maybe you need to come to the altar and repent from sin. However you need to respond, however God is moving in your heart, don't resist his spirit today. Respond to him.